can all say on common ground, we can say that this has been absolutely successful. So now what I'm going to do is to, well, it wasn't recorded. I was just introducing my colleagues, uh, Veronica Sanchez and Jonathan Puon from the uh, Benemerita Universidad um, Autónoma de Puebla in Mexico. I was saying that this is the, uh, the final um, result of this project that they have, of this uh, meeting that they had, this conference that they have on education, on uh, languages. They work both for the Facultad de Lenguas, which is the School of Languages at this university, uh, this wonderful university in Puebla. I have the pleasure of um, having been there with them and uh, I know them very well and I know that this is going to be a beautiful presentation and that you will be interested in working, reading, um, citing, why not, this uh, book. And now it is time for them to do the presentation that they have prepared. Uh, please, Veronica, please, Jonathan, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you for such a great presentation, Jose Luis. It's such an honor to be with you uh, from so far away, from the other side of the, of the big lake. And uh, this is really, really a pleasure to be here. And also I would like to start thanking uh, your eagerness, uh, your support and your trust on this project. And also to thank the Common Ground uh, for being so confident in this project that really, that took so long. <laughs> it took more or less two years so far. You know that, that um, editing a book takes uh, a lot of effort takes a lot of uh, interest of the part of the editors. But finally, we have this uh, great uh, product that took really long. But one of the main things that we really highlight here is that uh, we wanted to give voice from the different people at the uh, ground that we are, that's, that's probably what we want to connect with the common ground because we are sharing ground the ones who, who publish in this book towards the, some of the same interests, some of the uh, same problems regarding teacher education, language teacher education in a context such as Mexico. So what we're doing this uh, morning in Mexico, in Puebla, Mexico, central Mexico, and afternoon in, in Valencia, España, is uh, to present a little bit of how we, uh, the process to get to this product. So uh, this is the book. Thanks, Common Ground. Thanks, Jose Luis. And I'm presented with my, uh, my colleague, Jonathan Paul Castro. Fatima Encina Prudencio, who was another colleague who worked really hard on the book, has retired. But she's, she's working. She's still collaborating with us. So we would like to share um, first some of the context of this book. So the book was born in the following context, and Jonathan will present this. Thank you so much, Vero. So we would like to tell you the story of uh, the story of, <laughs> of a group of teachers who gather and start to think that there was a need for teacher um, trainers of so trainers to have a voice. Um, I don't know um, the European context uh, very much, but uh, at least in, in Mexico, and I should probably say Latin America, there is this, this um, over the past 10 or 15 years, there's, there's been this tendency to um, create different types of conferences and congresses. Um, just because um, you have an opportunity to create a conference and a congress on language and, and specifically foreign language teaching. And practically every single university creates its own uh, conference, apart from the associations, uh, the, the biggest association for language teaching in Mexico is Mextiso. Of course, it, it is only an association for, for English language teachers, but we started to think that we didn't have a, precisely a voice for the trainers of trainers. And so we uh, thought that maybe uh, it was a good opportunity not only to gather uh, trainers of trainers uh, regarding foreign languages, but also uh, trainers, trainers of trainers um, that also um, teach Spanish and why not our national languages or our indigenous languages? Because, um, you know, in Mexico we speak, um, 
I shouldn't say we, but uh, 68 indigenous languages are spoken. So we came up with the idea of this conference at Congreso Internacional de Formadores en Enseñanza de Lenguas, which was uh, first, uh, which first took place in, in 2016. And in that, in that year, we had a conference that had uh, five plenary, plenary speakers, six discussion tables, 71 presentations, one poster session, and two book presentations. Um, we noticed that there was a need for trainers, for trainers of trainers to have a voice. And from that, we thought, well, this is, this is something that uh, is worth um, continuing. And two years later, in 2019, we expanded. Uh, we grew like drastically from having a, a, a small venue uh, in the language department at WAP, that we moved to a bigger um, venue, which is the Complejo Cultural Universitario that Jose Luis visited uh, in, in 2019. And we expanded a lot. We uh, went from 300 participants to 600 participants. Um, teachers, trainers really wanted to have a voice. And we decided that it was a good moment for their voices, for their research to have a permanent um, presentation, which was, and that's why we, uh, we discussed the idea of having a book uh, with Jose Luis and we had a call for publication. In that year, uh, we received several publications, several uh, proposals and, and Barry is going to tell you about uh, in a minute. So what I would like to say in short is that we in Mexico uh, noticed a growing need for trainers of trainers to have a voice and also to uh, have a common uh, common place to uh, share their research, but also they really wanted to get it published and they really wanted to have a common place to, to, to discuss. And this is what we really wanted to do, to create and promote a discussion in the field of um, the trainers of trainers in language education in Mexico. Thank you, Jonathan. So we ended up with this product, with this publication. We had these conversations with Jose Luis during her staying here. And when he went back home, we uh, shared some ideas of the publication and we ended up with the collaboration and support of the Common Ground Research Networks. So we, we uh, published the, the call for the publication, as Jonathan said, and we received 24 proposals that would review and analyze first in Tornity. And then we went through a double blind peer review by academic peers and researchers from different universities in Mexico and two from the USA. To uh, review them, to uh, tell us whether those 40, 24 proposals were ready for uh, editing and the publication. So finally, we ended up with 18 proposals accepted and edited. As I said from the very beginning, it took us two years of work in this book. It took us really long. And then we had the pandemic in between, not in between, but probably at the end of the process. So that uh, broke a little bit the, the rhythm of the process of editing and publish this, this book. But finally, and uh, we, we had it. So the editors were mainly um, myself, but uh, Fatima, Jonathan, and Jose Luis working on all the processes of the, of, of the book. And we would like to thank very much Diony, who really helped us with the graphic and uh, the design, with all the little details that really the details believe us. And you know, most of you, that details really take long, is what it takes the longest in a book. So um, <clears throat> this is what we ended up, this beautiful thing uh, that's called Teachers Research in Language Education, Voices from the Field. 
which we finally uh, published in 2021. So the content, this is something, the structure of the book, it's uh, divided into 18 chapters 70 chapters are research reports, and one chapter is a dissemination article. And we decided for this dissemination article because we thought it was a very important topic that we need to share in our context and probably you, and you will see it, it's at the very end of the book. So in total, we have 36 authors belonging to different universities in Latin America. We have, for example, a, an author from Colombia. So the book was divided in two sections, in two main sections. The first section uh, reviews research on students and teachers and uh, teacher training and professional development experience. So we concentrated all the first part of the book on these studies. The second part are studies that can promote professional development of the teachers. So we try to include with, uh, uh, different perspectives, different voices, from the teachers. So this is what is the book about. So well, in, in the justification, uh, in the book, we try to uh, assume that all what we, what we do in, as professionals, as teachers, educators, it should be seen from a multi-dimensional and, co and complex uh, eye. What we do in our context, it's very, very complex because we commonly adopt models from overseas and we have to adapt them, you know, to the very, very local necessities. So that's what this research uh, uh, identified that teachers require more complex strategies and longer times to build and reconfigure the teacher practice. This is something that we took from Valladares and Ruth Roix. Also, the third justification that we want to highlight here is that teacher research should be seen as a form of continuous professional development. We should need to share it with uh, the conference, the CIFEL, the Congress. It's oral. We listen to them, but we wanted to put their voice into this book so that this uh, continuous idea of professional development can keep recorded in paper. And at the end, we thought that these academic spaces, you know, such as these publications, seek to promote the discussion of collegiate experiences based on research results in our context to influence decision making and implementation for language policies. So that we try to avoid uh, what we want to do is to uh, have some impact on our authority so that they can listen to us, listen to what we are doing in our context, listen to the necessities of our own context. And not only to uh, uh, adopt, you know, the overseas models that we have been doing during during, during a long time. Okay, so uh, we're going to present the content of the book. Uh, as I said, it's in total there, uh, there are 18 chapters. Uh, the first chapter, the introduction, you know, it's we present the book, we try to uh, put into words uh, our um, view of the purpose of the book. Well, chapter one, Chapter one, it's a very interesting chapter that explores agency. And the title is Exploring Teacher Agency in the National English Program for Basic Education in Sonora. The authors are Silvia Selene Moreno Carrasco and Ruth Roix from the north of Mexico, the very north, the very frontier. And what they do is they explore the subject of teacher agency in the National English Program in Mexico at basic education. So the aim of this uh, chapter, it's to give information about how the exercise, the, the teachers in this program exercise their agency in their classroom and which factor seems to affect the achievement of their agency. Why agency at this context? It is because, you know, the PRONI, the program, the National English Program at Basic Education was an implementation with very, very few resources in many senses, very few resources in uh, human resources and material resources. So it was very interesting to read how teachers, you know, uh, survived in this situation. So they use uh, an, a, a multiple case study. And one of the main results uh, is that the, uh, they say, the author says that agency may be better exercise and environment in which the teachers feels comfortable and professional acceptance. Acceptance, what's, some, what's an issue for the English teachers 
when they started the prony. Okay, in chapter two, we see the title is Factors, Factores que limitan la educación continua en el contexto de la educación privada. As you see, the book uh, have Spanish and English uh, uh, articles and research reports because we wanted to include all the language as much as possible. So what they do, uh, they, they, they review experiences in continuing education in foreign language teachers at the private universities in, teach, in Central Mexico. You know, private universities uh, normally break, uh, break the development of the teachers because they don't have resources. So what they, the aim of this, of this uh, uh, chapter was to explain the contextual situation uh, that these uh, teachers in private education experience when teaching languages in terms of uh, continuing education, you know, at the private co context, as I say. That was a, a, an investigation, an exploratory investigation. They use a, a document analysis and content analysis. So one of the main results in this chapter address that the, uh, how can I say, La dimensión laboral, as we said in Spanish, you know, the, the employment play a very key role, you know, uh, for the continuous development, continuous education for teachers in private education. So their, their employment status, you know, the, the contract uh, limit them to continue their professional de development a private education. They, 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 are, they are not allowed, they cannot continue their education. So as for chapter three, that is titled Antecedentes en la Exploración de los Procesos de Inclusión en la Enseñanza de Inglés. So this is another key topic, you know, include, uh, that it's inclusive education uh, from different perspectives. <clears throat> and uh, are, are very, very, sorry, sorry, are very important in our context, we are uh, in, in higher education, we are experiencing more and more the acceptance of uh, students with different, uh, you know, the concept, it's, it's changing all the time, but we say sometimes capacidades diferentes, uh, different uh, capacities with some, some sort of handicap situation, you know? So what the, the author says here is that they, they, they studied the strategies used by English teachers to achieve the inclusion of students in Chiapas with no previous training. You know, they explored the processes of inclusion of and, and, and different uh, frameworks. So this, they use an exploratory study and uh, they use a pilot study to uh, investigate how teachers acquire those um, know, acquire the knowledge, the, the competences and the abilities to uh, teach in, in classroom with certain type of students. So one of the results is that there is insufficient information on strategies, methodologies of techniques for teaching English to a student to study with different capacities of a special needs in Mexico. We need a lot of work on that. Chapter four is titled Formación de Evaluadores en Lengua Extranjera en su Impacto en Estudiantes en la UAM. UAM is a Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana, which is located in, in Mexico City. So the authors are Gabriela Cortez Sánchez y Gerardo Alfonso Pérez Barrada. So they, they explore training and experiences of foreign language teachers in, 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 in how they assessed in, in a language center in, in, a, in this university. It's the largest university in Mexico. So they try to explore the expertise of these teachers to carry out evaluation. They use a quantitative study using a survey. And one of the main results addresses the, the, the issue that in this type of universities, teachers need training in assessment. So normally, as when we arrive to teach languages, uh, programs, language teaching programs, uh, train teachers to be teachers, but there is very little knowledge and training in language assessment. Okay, so as for chapter five, uh, which is titled, how, how come you are a teacher from language teacher voices? So this is from Irais Ramirez Valdera, San Patricia Maria Guillén uh, Kwamatsi, which is a, a state very, very close to our state here. And it's a very a state which a, no, a large number of indigenous 
people, Tlaxcala, it is called Tlaxcala, and they uh, use uh, narratives so that they could listen their students at the language teacher education program to know why they decided to become language teachers in a state which is in the majority a very indigenous, uh, with a very a large indigenous and, uh, population. So they explore pre-service and in-service reasons to become teachers uh, to the point in time where they decided to do so and they perceive their benefits. So they, they use an exploratory a descriptive research in which data were, were collected by online and an open questionnaire. So the result is that at the very beginning, the students didn't want to be language teachers. They joined the program because they were they, they felt attracted to the language. But little by little, they became attracted to the uh, to the to the to the career to develop this uh, career because they they realized that they could get a job quite fast. On the other hand, the other students, there, there is a very good group of students who decided to join this language teacher education program because they have family who were in contact, were teachers or were in contact with teacher education somehow. A very interesting chapter. So chapter six, it is titled EFL Preservice Teachers Perceptions and the Practical Docente One Teacher Support. So, you know, teacher training, it's also an issue to research in these programs. So the author is Ana Fabiola Velasco Argente, and she studies the students' perception of teacher training program on mentoring in their teaching practice at university in southern Mexico, very, very southern Mexico, uh, and uh, in the border with Belize. So to understand, uh, the aim was to understand to what extent these pre-service teachers feel that the practicum prepares them to the teaching English as a foreign language we know. And we, there is a lot of uh, literature regarding the importance of mentoring supervision in language practicum. Uh, she used a collective study. And one of the main results is that uh, she suggests uh, that in, in her study that there should be more practical moments from the very beginning of the program so that uh, there is a, a better guidance for the students and also teachers, supervisors, teachers, mentors, we should develop more abilities to do our job, you know, to change from the very prescriptive view of teaching, mentoring, and supervision to be more formative in our guidance. So chapter seven, it's, it's uh, titled Analysis La Competencia Interac Interacción Aulica en la Clase de Lengua Inglesa. That's a very interesting chapter from Mariel Vázquez Carranza and Liliana Maria Villalobos González. So they, they research the type of interaction strategies the teacher uh, and the students achieve to, uh, the, the students and teachers use to achieve great pedagogical effectiveness. So what they do is they try to identify the relationship between the language that students and teachers use in the classroom, in their interactions, and the outcomes the students produce, you know, after, after the class. They use conversational analysis. And what they say is that, uh, in these programs, in these language teaching programs, uh, it is necessary to promote more language interactions in the classroom, right? So, uh, and they, they find out that the interactions, oral interactions are very limited to basic questions, to basic interactions, to basic uh, question answer interaction in the classroom. And they propose to be more creative, to be more complex in the interactions that we uh, have with the students in the classroom, in the language, in, in, especially in the language uh, uh, teaching classroom. As for chapter eight, la licenciatura en la enseñanza de inglés y el centro de acto acceso, taller de preparación para certificación de inglés. So this is a connection, this Norma Lucero Perez Rodriguez and Rosalba Leticia connect. Uh, they work in this language teaching program and they also support the self access center uh, and they, they promote workshops for the certification in a teaching education degree. So they reported on the experiences of this pilot workshop to prepare the certifications, you know, the PET, the preliminary English test in English. They use uh, um, a mixed method study using a descriptive uh, design. So what they suggest is they should be 
uh, when, when in, in programs like our program or many programs where they connect language teacher education program and self access centers, they found that there is very little connection, there is very little communication that what what we do in the classroom, it's, very, it's not that connected with what they practice in the self uh, access centers. So what they did is they created, they implemented some sort of um, uh, workshop so that they connect both contexts of both uh, programs so that the workshop to prepare it's more feasible, it's more coherent to give more uh, better results. So chapter nine, la, inter la internacionalización eje fundamental en el quehacer del docente de lenguas from Jennifer Cucurachi Moctezuma is the Angelica Muñoz Cortez and Alma Patricia. This is from a, from a state in the east, southern east of Mexico. They present the perspectives of administrators, teachers and students regarding the linguistic and the intercultural skills regarding the process of internalization of a language teacher. You know that from 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 certain time, I would say from uh, eight, 10 years ago, the, this this concept, this idea, and this moving of internationalization in Mexico and in, in, in Mexican universities have has arrived and tried to promote internal, internationalization in many many ways, but also sometimes at at the, at the very local. Uh, context, we don't really know what it is about. So what they do, the aim of this uh, of this uh, chapter was to uh, know the perceptions, needs, and practices and actions that, those, that the, the teachers, students, and administrators at a certain university and a certain program uh, have regarding this implementation of this concept, of this idea, of this policy, of internationalization in, in this program. They use a descriptive uh, focus uh, as, a, as, a, as a study using observations and a survey. So what they say, and I wanna read it in Spanish because it's very, very, very interesting what they say. So las actividades laborales de los docentes administrativos pertenecientes a la Dirección General de Relaciones Internacionales se desarrolló en un contexto con características internacionales. However, However, when they put all this down to the context of the programs, there is very, very, very little knowledge about what internalization is about. Okay, and chapter three through chapter 18 will be presented by Jonathan. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, thank you, Vera. Chapter 10 through 18. <laughs> um, so, as you can see, we're going um, as fast as possible because we have very limited time to, to discuss this. So this is a, a, a friendly invitation to, to choose the chapter that you may find interested, interesting and, 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 and give it a try and, and, and become more familiar with these uh, themes. So uh, I will be telling you a little bit more about uh, the chapters I am more familiar with uh, because of different reasons. For example, chapter 10, which is entitled Language Assessment Perceptions Through the Eyes of Undergraduate Accounting Students. This is a chapter that you uh, will find interesting if you are uh, more familiar with uh, language assessment in higher education. Uh, the group of uh, colleagues and authors, Elba Mendez, Maria Alejandra Archundia, and Rosalba Olguin, the, the three of them, um, work at a public university in central Mexico. And it's a large university, actually. It's, it's the same university Vera and I uh, work at. And um, what they are in, they've been uh, researching about language assessment for a long time now. And what they wanted to do with this uh, um, project, this research and, and, and chapter was to discuss the perceptions of undergraduate accounting students regarding foreign language components in, in the admission exams. I don't know <clears throat> if you are familiar with uh, the admission exams in public universities, at least in Mexico, we have, uh, we have to have an admission exam because always the number of <coughs> candidate, <coughs> sorry, candidates outnumbers the number of uh, students who are accepted or who get a place in a public university. So um, over the past 10 years, um, this university in, in Mexico implemented uh, the element of foreign language, in this case, English, 
which has pros and cons, and this is something that they discuss um, through a mixed method approach. And <coughs> very interesting because um, they focus their attention on accounting and students and uh, some of the you know, results that they um, discuss is that the special attention uh, needs to be uh, given to the way potential students of such courses, such courses of uh, account, accounting courses, perceived language learning and language uh, learning assessment. Um, uh, one of the most important elements that they uh, discuss is that um, integrated language assessment appears to be common, a common feature uh, on what participants agree with. In other words, they um, also, participants, students in this case, highlight the idea that in, um, integral uh, language assessment has to be an element that teachers um, promote in language teaching. One of the main problems of these programs is that they have what they call language departments and this does, does not promote integrated language assessment. So the following um, chapter, which is chapter 11, uh, teachers entitled Teachers of the Curious uh, Perspectives and Attitudes Towards ICT, a case study. This is an interesting um, study because uh, this is from a group of uh, colleagues from uh, Universidad Veracruzana, which is um, <clears throat> in South Mexico, uh, whose first uh, distance ELT language program um, was ever created in public universities in Mexico. So um, the authors are Oscar Manuel Narvaez, Patricia Nunez, and Gabriela Guadalupe Estrada. So these are uh, author, you know, colleagues, professors who um, have been working in this distance program in ELT. And what they wanted to, uh, interesting because uh, this happened before the pandemic, <laughs> they wanted to find out the perceptions and attitudes of English uh, teachers in teacher education programs towards the use of ICT in their academic lives. So <clears throat> before the pandemic, this group of teachers and these authors were, uh, you know, already interested in this uh, idea of, you know, discussing what's going on with um, the relationship between teacher education and ICT programs or ICTs in general. And they, they did this through a mixed method approach. And uh, they did it in two stages. First, they uh, um, used an open-ended questionnaire and then they, they did some uh, interviews with um, language educators. Some of the main results um, are these. Teacher educators uh, also seem to, well, they seem to, to firmly, firmly believe that face-to-face -face traditional instruction is equally valued by teachers. I don't know if this is true uh, anymore, uh, but this is the, at least a discussion that they had before the pandemic. Um, they, this, as they claim, this actually corresponds to the students' preference, preferences in terms of face-to-face uh, -face interaction in previous study and the same context. This, it's important to highlight that the, uh, this program also shares a face-to-face -face program. So they, in this university, they have both a distance program and a face-to-face -face program in ELT. So if you're interested in, in comparing and finding out that, um, you know, some of the uh, <clears throat> similar, uh, similarities and differences of these two programs, this is a good chapter to uh, look at. Chapter 12 towards a decolonial research methodology um, from a group, of, from, from a colleague uh, uh, in Colombia, Julia Posada Ortiz, uh, the author. Uh, the, the main theme of this chapter is the sense of community upon teaching students in Colombia with a decolonial perspective. As you know, uh, <coughs> uh, periphery countries, um, which Mexico is included and Colombia as well and many others, are more and more talking about the decolonization of teaching, the decolonization of um, method, teach, research methodology, etc. So. Um, the main aim of this uh, chapter is to analyze the feasibility and acceptability of research methodology with a decolonial perspective, and also to learn about the census of community uh, of a group of English language teachers. Uh, they, uh, she did this through a qualitative descriptive uh, research, and one of the main results is that 
according to the participants' perceptions, families are the first and most important communities for that, and, and this community plays a very important role in the decisions they make for their professional future. And even some of these participants or members are not with them anymore. So this is an interesting chapter in terms of how uh, the discussion of decolonization in terms of research, methodology, and language teaching is going on in countries such as Colombia. Chapter 13, which is entitled, and this is a very interesting chapter, I will I should tell you a little bit more about this, entitled General and Community Medicine Students Evaluation Regarding the Flipped Classroom Models Implementation. <coughs> First of all, I'm sorry, if you are interested in periphery um, models of education, this is a very interesting Periphery Models of Education and Language Teaching, uh, I should say. This is an interesting uh, chapter to look at because Abelardo Romero and Laura Villanueva, they work at a periphery campus that belongs to Benemerita Universidad Autónoma de Puebla, our university, Peros and, 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 and my university, uh, but not at the main campus. The main campus is located in the city of Puebla, but the, 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 the city of Puebla is just one of the campus that the university has. Um, the university uh, over the past 20 years has been um, uh, opening several campus in, per in, in periphery areas, uh, what we call the regions of the state of Puebla. So this, um, in, this research took place in one of these uh, periphery campuses. And actually it's called Tesutlan in the Sierra up in the mountains. So the main aim of this, uh, chapter is to explore or was to explore the evaluation that Mexican university students do of the implementation of flipped classroom model. And again, this took place before the pandemic. So this is something that would be worth looking at uh, because you would have a perspective of what was, uh, what, what, what was the discussion before the pandemic and maybe what would the discussion be after the pandemic. Um, they did this through a, a case study and, and, and a quasi-experimental uh, type of research. Um, the main result of this uh, chapter is that the flipped classroom model was evaluated satisfactorily by the students. Uh, and mainly this was to the fact that their interaction with the teacher was allowed, which resulted in the creation of an environment of collaborative learning between students and teachers. Following this chapter 14, um, entitled La Gramática del Libro de Texto de Inglés como Lengua Extranjera, uh, authored by Sara Quintero and Sonny Angelo, um, was um, the main uh, aim of this uh, chapter was to, <clears throat> I'm sorry, examine for language, um, I mean, um, English language textbooks um, as a foreign language to identify the approximation or the approach that these um, themes, uh, grammatical themes uh, have to develop communicative competence. They did this through a descriptive study and a case study. And one of the main um, implications of this is that uh, books are conceived for language, for teaching and learning foreign languages they need to be um, implemented. They need to have three different dimensions of grammar um, and not only one. So if you're interested in um, grammar and English language textbooks, this is a good book to look at. Following this uh, chapter 15, Exploring Clash of Discourse Strategies to Enhance Communication, authored by Tito, oops, my screen just went crazy. Tito uh, <clears throat> Mata and Antonio Ivan, um, what they did and, and, and was to try to identify the classroom discourse strategies that teachers used in their spoken interaction with their students in order to enhance communication and promote classroom interactional competence. This was done through uh, exploratory research uh, and also recorded interviews. <clears throat> what they found out uh, as a main um, result was that elicitation strategies such as prompts back channeling repetition and self repetition can be very useful tools to promote participation and production because attention is focused on students and that they feel attended to and encouraged to speak. This seems to be 
an old fashioned topic, but let's not forget that some of the, some of the topics uh, remain um, uh, valid. Uh, and it's worth looking at these because this comes from a classroom, from a group, from, 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 uh, from both uh, teachers who became researchers, but before teachers as many of us uh, have. Um, then Producción Escrita, which is chapter uh, 16, uh, de Géneros Textuales como Propuesta de Evaluación Formativa en Español como Lengua Extranjera. As you can see, this is a chapter that develops the topic of Spanish as a foreign language, authored by Leticia Temochin and Norma Marina Rodriguez. Um, in this university in Central Mexico, WAP, there is a program for um, <coughs> uh, um, students of Spanish as a foreign language. And what they did was to assess um, written production of Spanish, um, looking at different uh, textual genres. And they uh, wanted to look at what uh, students uh, included uh, in terms of argumentation and narration. So they did this through a descriptive study and they analyzed um, textual markers uh, through uh, the, uh, of evaluation. So uh, the results of this uh, study, uh, the main results are um, that the um, written production was, according to the participants, a valid instrument of formative evaluation to determine uh, students' improvement and that this should be a continuous practice uh, when implementing uh, Spanish courses for foreign speakers. Getting close to the final chapter speaking, uh, chapter 17, picking into four Mexican high school students' journals. This is an interesting um, <clears throat> chapter, not because I authored it, co-authored it, but because this is a chapter that <clears throat> includes journals, but not from the teacher's perspective, but uh, from the student's perspective. Uh, many, in many cases, trainers of trainers uh, in terms of language uh, education, uh, look at and use journals for um, trainees or language teachers to you know, have a, this conversation and to, and to discuss what's going on in terms of the practicum. In this case, the journals were used as uh, <clears throat> as a tool to ignite the students' confidence by writing in, in English about their interests, concerns, and needs. This is a, a chapter that was, that this is a research that took place in, a, in the periphery as well. So if you would like to learn about the implementation of journal and the development of writing through journals in periphery context, this is a good chapter to look at. This was uh, conducted to a descriptive exploratory study. And one of the main um, results is that um, it is highlighted that the necessity to build a bridge between academic literacy practices and extended practices outside the classroom can be uh, conducted through journal writing. Uh, so this uh, journal writing fo focuses mainly on the student's perspective. Finally, chapter 18, Alphabetización Inicial, Aprendizaje Infantil, Métodos y Rol del Docente. As you can see, this one, uh, this chapter is about um, literacy, uh, but at the uh, early childhood education level. And this is authored by Alma Carrasco, Mara Serrano, and Carla Villaseñor, uh, all of them from uh, WAP, uh, University in Central Mexico. And what they did was that they looked at five, five different uh, generations of um, what we call in Mexico, libros de texto gratuitos or um, free access. These are provided by the government, uh, public textbooks. And um, what they looked at was precisely the different ways in which uh, the social practices of the language were approached through these different books uh, or libros de texto gratuito. Um, what they uh, concluded uh, at the end of this uh, research was that they, they, there needs to be um, a bridge between what uh, we call in, in Mexican Spanish uh, alphabetization inicial, which is uh, when the students are learning to 
recognized letters, the alphabet, etc. And the actual reading uh, of the language and that this should not be separated uh, elements, um, yet they should be uh, approached as complementary elements, one of each other, because this is one of the biggest problems in early childhood education, at least in public education in Mexico. So this is the end of the 18 chapters. As you can see, we have all sorts of different uh, approaches, different contexts, different ways of looking at things, and all of them from, from, from teachers' perspectives. Thank you so much. Vero? Thank you, Jonathan. And well, what, what after, you know, giving this general panorama of the content of the book, of the content of the chapters, we want to highlight some of the contributions that we think we are, um, we have in this book. So from CIFEL 2000 and CIFEL 2019, we recognize a significant development in language education research in Mexico. And we wanted to give it a permanent voice. And the permanent voice is exactly here reflected in this book, right? So uh, also we think that this publication includes studies in a variety of social, cultural, educational and institutional contexts carried in Mexico and Latin America with various methodological designs and approaches from different theoretical perspectives, which is also um, the one of the, how can I say, good aspects or good uh, of the values of the book. So also we think that in this, in the current uh, context of challenges such as Mexican and Latin America in terms of language education, we seek to promote the exchange discussion of experiences and results of research and reflection to influence, as we said from the very beginning, as influence the decision making for the implementation of language policies regarding teacher education. We want to have a voice not only among us as colleagues, but also to have certain impact on our authorities in terms of language policies in teacher education and teacher professionalization from language teaching, no, no, not only foreign language teaching, but we are open this, uh, this fan to uh, foreign languages, uh, original languages, uh, foreign languages, and Spanish, which is also what we need. So this is what we wanted to present today. Uh, in, in this uh, in this uh, conference, and just highlight that you could sorry that you could get the book. It's in your a uh, message and in, in the chat in this bookstore in the Common Ground bookstore, and uh, the, you will have a discount <laughs> for being in this conference. But this is all. As we said in Spanish, es, por, es, lo, es lo que tenemos este día. Muchísimas gracias. Lean el libro, está fabuloso. Es un libro con muchas perspectivas culturales, sociales y de contextos muy diversos y que creemos que es un libro, un libro que les va a, a complementar una visión de lo que estamos haciendo en México y Latinoamérica. Muchísimas gracias. Yeah, thank you, uh, Veronica. Thank you, Jonathan, for the wonderful presentation of the, of the book. Um, as they mentioned, it is a book in which the experiences are shared. It is to not only, not only to research, but it's to give um, teachers, lecturers, the opportunity of telling what's going on in their classrooms, how they teach, how they do things, what they really uh, what they're really interested in, and how they do their research, their results that they came up to, and the conclusions sometimes of this day-to-day uh, -day, uh, research that they do when they teach. It is very, when you read the, the, the book, you find really what teachers, what lectures are. I mean, you can find this written from the perspective of someone who is in front of the board and who is there with all the uh, kids, with all the students, it depends on the age, but there you will see that their results, their conclusions that they bring in these uh, different chapters are written from this perspective of reality. And that's why the title cannot be better. It is the voices, what you will be reading. You will read the voices of all these people. Well, um, we only have um, some more minutes. I don't know exactly how many, yeah. 
So maybe 10 minutes to, well, answer any possible questions. As we are in Mexico, we are in Spain, and, and uh, we can have both questions in, in both Spanish and English. We will, don't worry, we will translate the answers and the questions to the other language. So if you want to ask a question in Spanish or in English, please feel free. There is another thing that I wanted to say, and it is the picture that we have uh, in the cover of the book. It is by Manuel Ruiz Garcia, uh, who is a very famous painter uh, in Granada, in Spain. And he gave us this wonderful picture for the cover of the book. And we want to thank him, of course, too. So if there are any questions, if not, I will ask you, Veronica, Jonathan, if you are prepared. Okay, well, because uh, yeah. when I, I mean, when I participated, it was, uh, I felt absolutely honored to, to be part of this uh, publication. But what comes next? What is the next step, Veronica? Well, the next step, Jose Luis, is, is, a is still a challenge, as you know. You know, the next step, it's probably, we, we are thinking that uh, we would like to expand, you know, our vision more to hear the voices of those teachers in the periphery. Normally, we concentrate in the cities. We started to you know, achieve those teachers in the periphery. And when we say the periphery is that, for example, where, where English is taught at the very north of the at the very north of the state in a very uh, indigenous place with the with other languages are spoken, for example. We would like to hear the voices of those teachers who are training teachers to teach original languages such as Nahuatl, for example, in Mexico, what they do in terms of teacher training, what how they are you know, giving, you know, uh, this voice to other teachers. Uh, other, other, the, the next step is also to work on uh, something, a, a gap that we have here in, in, in our university, especially in Central Mexico, is teaching Spanish, not only as a foreign language, but also as a lengua de retorno, o sea, estudiantes, que vienen de regreso de Estados Unidos, que los han regresado, que hablan muy poco español, hablan bien inglés, pero que su inglés no es, no es académico y menos su español. So this is another challenge we have, and this is something that we would like to also put it into another book, <laughs> if possible. I think that we have a question for, from uh, Shamila. Yes. Hi, good evening. I am from Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean. Um, excellent presentation. Very interesting. And I look forward to reading the book. Just one question and specifically about Mexico. Um, and I, I hope I got this right. 68 languages. So um, I just wanted to ask specifically, just in your view from um, completing this wonderful book, um, in terms of training teachers, you know, um, what is the way forward in terms of the strategies um, you would recommend, you know, um, for teachers, especially in classrooms, given that, you know, um, you have language education where there are about 68 languages and the, the language of instruction, let's say it's English, I'm not sure if I'm correct there, how do teachers deal with it in classrooms that are not homogenous? You know, where you want to value all the languages. Um, I'm not sure as well about, you know, the context in each area of Mexico, but this is what, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm really interested in. And how do you deal with it and not denigrate any of the students' languages, you know, in terms of training teachers to deal with those areas. And, and finally, just one last question from this book that I'm really interested in. <clears throat> um, have you at this point influenced or, or began influencing any language policy just emanating from the rich research um, you know, from this book? Thanks. <laughs> John, I think that you would like to answer this. <laughs> it's, it's your area mainly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you, Sharmila. Um, I'm gonna try to be very brief because of the time concern, but we can share emails. 
Um, the, the, regarding the first question, this is, a, this is a, a, a current struggle in Mexico, and I'm gonna contextualize this. Why? Number one, um, we have a progressive government uh, in Mexico, what, what some people would call progressive government. And this progressive government uh, is implementing policies to um, make visible the, not only indigenous languages, but also in, uh, indigenous peoples. Therefore, what's going on in education, uh, what's going on in, at the policy, uh, social policy level is affecting, of course, educational levels. Uh, this um, means that English language teaching has been slowed down. I don't want to say that it has been stopped because it will never stop but it has been slowed down to give more importance to programs that uh, promote indigenous language uh, teaching. Nevertheless, at the classroom level, there is a still a struggle because of course there is ideologies. We as language educators have learned uh, through um, dominant ideologies, dominant models of education and getting rid of those ideologies, ideas, etc., is not easy. So uh, in short, I could probably say that there is a struggle. Uh, more and more uh, uh, awareness has been raised about the importance of uh, maintaining and revitalizing indigenous languages, but the classroom level is still a struggle. And is, this is something that is worth uh, researching because um, the different uh, regions. Mexico is a very uh, heterogeneous country in many ways, culturally speaking, economically speaking, socially speaking, etc. So the, the, the research on how this uh, clash between English, Spanish, and indigenous languages uh, is is still in 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 in, 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 in trying to be developed, but the discussion is there. But uh, research needs to be conducted to know more about this. Um, regarding the second question, I think that um, what we could uh, tell you is that at the, at the local level in our university we have promoted and, and, and implemented, um, implemented, sorry, uh, proposed the implementation of a language policy in, at the local level in the university. In, in what we want to do is to uh, highlight the importance not only of foreign language teaching, but also Spanish and indigenous languages. Traditionally speaking, foreign languages have been highlighted and given um, more importance because of many reasons, we, we could discuss that, but this is not the, the moment. Um, and what we want to do is that the, the stakeholders at the university level look at Spanish and indigenous languages and give the same status little by little. So we could have a, 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 a deeper conversation on this, but I think time is up. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jonathan, for such a detailed uh, answer. And of course, Sharmila, thank you for the interesting uh, question. That was uh, really interesting. And uh, what else? I don't know if we have any other question, or if not, well, I think uh, this was a, a wonderful presentation, Veronica, Jonathan, again. Congratulations. Uh, as you know, uh, we are now at the 29th learning conference uh, hosted here in Valencia in Spain by the Polytechnic University and by the University of Valencia also. And uh, well, we have uh, two days ahead to keep on working on learning. You are all more than welcome to publish your uh, publications as we mentioned this morning at the opening session and in our journals in both English and Spanish. And of course, we can talk about the idea of bringing a book as the one that we are celebrating today. Thank you to the Universidad Benemérita de Puebla, Benemérita Universidad de Puebla, 
And uh, thank you also to all of you for being here in this presentation today. Eh, muchas gracias a todos. Muchas gracias por estar aquí y seguimos adelante. Un abrazo fuerte. Muchas gracias, José Luis. Muchas gracias a todos por hacer este puente. Por favor, gracias a las autoridades de Common Ground por hacer espejo a lo que nosotros queremos eh, decir, a nuestras voces y que se oigan más allá de nuestras fronteras eh, en Latinoamérica. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Gracias a ti, principalmente, por creer en este proyecto. Bueno, muchas gracias. Gracias a vosotros. Gracias, Jonathan. Un abrazo gracias. fuerte, amigo. Gracias a todos. ¿Podemos acabar?